Um, have you ever, have either of you been ever been able to use FMLA? Or another way of saying the question is that, you know, um, Tamara, when you had your children, did you get any unpaid, job protected unpaid time off under this law? No, um, that law I find, I've seen it like in my, my contract as far as working, you know, my working contract. Um, it's not for part-timers. Part-timers do not get benefits. The companies are only only giving this opportunity for full-time people. So as a part-timer, if you choose to have a child, then you chose to not have a job. They're not going to hold your job for you when you come back. And when, when I had my child, I didn't work. As I was on public assistance. I didn't work. It wasn't, you know, planned pregnancy. I chose to, you know, go along with the pregnancy, but I didn't work. I was home. On top of the fact that I was very sick, I didn't have paid sick days, so either way, you know, I was in a bad way. So I, I didn't work when I was pregnant with both of my daughters. And, so, and you didn't have jobs to go back to? I didn't to get have, it, no. So then you I had, had to, to go resign. And, yep, I was on public assistance for some time. Then you have to go through the whole process now of child care. And now you're trying to find a new job. And you have to hide the fact that you have children. That's exactly what I was going to You definitely ask. have to. I, you never tell employers that, you have, that you're a mom, that you have children. You have to make up reasons as to why this gap is on your resume. I have a colleague um, and a friend who refers to the United States as one of the most family hostile countries in the developed world, and I think it is it is stunning that in twenty in you know in the twenty first century that you have to lie to an employer about whether or not you're a mom, yeah, and yet mm -hmm. we're a country that supposedly believes in family values. Yeah. Um, Malik, have you had an, an have, when um, I mean you talked a little about when your I think second child was born, but have you um, uh, been able to take unpaid time off under the F, under probably what would be the Family Medical Leave Act? Actually, no. <laughs> I I have seen a lot of um, <laughs> I have seen a lot of my f my friends. Let me put it this way, because I for me, even if I'm sick, I try to go to work because I I I I, I don't want to lose even a day's pay in my paycheck because that will mean that readjusting and sacrificing to be able to provide for my family and you know, pay my rent and provide a shelter for my kids and myself and my wife and, you know, buy diapers and pay my bills. And so even when I'm sick, I, I try to go to work because I don't want a, a situation where what is uh, that, that I'm going to put my family in danger. But I have seen a colleague of mine who got fired because he called in sick three times in a week. And you know, because of that, I have seen a lot of people come to work just like me. Not because they don't know they are sick, but because they don't want to lose their job. Because if you take a pay sick days, uh, before you come back, they're feeling somebody in your position. And, 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 and that is what we've been dealing with in the retail industry. And that is what we're trying to change. And that is what the Retail Action Project is working hard, organizing retail workers, giving them power to drive the policy change themselves. That's uh, certainly, certainly very true. And of course, as somebody who occasionally goes into retail, I would like to know that the person that I'm about to buy something from isn't sick, both because I'm a nice person and I would like to think that I live in a country where they could be home in bed, yeah. um, but also I don't want to get sick. Okay. And I mean, that's, that's a real, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we're here today talking about this and letting people know. Um, we've talked, touched a little bit on the issues of schedules. I want to turn it to Carrie for a little bit um, to sort of um, kind of give us a little bit of the overview. Um, but, you know, I've read a lot of the work, especially by this um, fantastic um, set of academics out at the University of Chicago, um, Julie Henley and Susan Lambert, who've done some very interesting work understanding what's going on in the retail industry. I was just at a conference a couple weeks ago. Can you tell us a little bit about what we know about scheduling practices, and then we can talk about some of your experiences? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think... There's been a lot of fabulous research on it. It's really exciting. I think what RAP is trying to do is really pay, use that amazing research and pave a path towards a solution um, because we're talking about the most disenfranchised, largest workforce in our country. It's a growing part-time work in retail. Uh, the involuntary part-time workforce has tripled in the past decade. 
I mean, this is, this is why the time is now to really start to think about how to take on these issues. Um, we can't afford to wait any longer because the more that the part-time workforce grows, the more the bargaining power of workers is going to be weakened, um, their ability to navigate day-to-day -day sol solutions and, and situations the way that Malik and Tamara are talking about is going to become even harder. So when we pass laws, oftentimes these laws don't in touch workers' lives. Um, and, and increasingly, uh, our, our public policies are really out of touch with today's workforce. Um, they really don't acknowledge the, the extent to which people are working part-time and, and are excluded from, from benefits like FMLA, or if you work two part-time jobs, you know, you might work, earn too much to get Medicaid. Um, you know, it's really... That'll change. <laughs> hopefully that will change. We're all, we're all hoping. Um, but, I, but I think that, you know, there's, this is really... Um, this is really the time to take this on. We can't afford to let this problem get worse. Um, what we're finding in the discounted jobs research is that, um, you know, in terms of scheduling, it really structures everything else about a retail worker's job, um, and it and it intersects in a really powerful way with race and gender. Um, so. 55% of the black workers we surveyed are part-time versus just 39% of the white workers. And if you're a part-time worker, you're earning a lower hourly wage. Only 9% of the part-time workers we surveyed had health insurance from their employer. Just 25% had paid time off. Um, there is really a, a tremendous disparity in the retail industry between part-time and full-time work. And this incentivizes and fuels the growth of part-time work. And what we're finding is not just about part-time anymore. It's not that, oh, well, you have 20 hours a week and you know when you're going to work and then you get a second job. What we're seeing is really the growth of just-in-time scheduling practices. And so it's wrecking havoc on our members' lives. Um, we're seeing the growth of hours. Hours fluctuations are increasing, which Tamara can definitely speak more about. Um, workers are legally misclassified. They're classified as part-time workers. Maybe they're lucky enough um, for extended period of time to work full-time, but then excluded from benefits because they're classified as part-time. Um, and then they're also being expected to be available for open availability um, for basically every hour that the store is open. And yeah. so, um, and you can get punished for not being available for time that you're not getting paid for. Um, we also, what was really interesting, was found that 43% that of the workers we surveyed in the discounted jobs research had to be available for unpaid call-in shifts. So you get scheduled for a shift, you're on the schedule for 11 o'clock, I need to call at 9 a.m. that day to find out if I'm working. Um, and what was really interesting was that actually um, caregivers, um, moms, you know, parents and, and people who take care of elderly are, have even more, um, are more likely to have these types of shifts. And so uh, we found you know, that it's over half of the, of the parents that we surveyed found out about, on some percentage of their weekly schedule, whether or not they're working the same day. And so, how do you arrange for childcare? How do you arrange for exactly. childcare in that yes. kind of situation? That's, that's well, that's exactly where, where my whole, you know, right. my threat came in from, you know, yeah. aside from the fact that she was sick, but they would call me on the day that I was originally scheduled off, and it's always the same thing, you know. Oh, we have a really high goal, and I didn't realize it, and can you come in? and I'm like, well, no, because I, I didn't make arrangements for a sitter, so I cannot come in. And they're like, well, can't you just ask your mom? My mom has a life. I can't just pick up the phone and say, well, mom, I need you to, you know, that, that's, that's not fair. And the other issue with scheduling is the, the fluctuation. I have to raise a family, and my hours fluctuate from as little as 15 hours a week I've even had four hours a week, all the way to like 25 or 29 hours. And there's no way that I can plan or try to keep my household in order when I don't know what my weekly, sal my, you know, my weekly paycheck is going to be. One week is $150 because I'm making $10 an hour for the long list of duties that I <laughs> mentioned earlier all the way, you know, to um, 
you know, to, oh, just over 200. Either way, it's still not enough. But at least if I know for sure, I'm guaranteed 25 hours a week, I can plan. I can take a piece from here and, you know, kind of figure things out and make a budget. But you cannot do that. And what happens is you rely on social services. Mm -hmm. There's a 34% a of retail workers rely on welfare, social services. This is costing us all. And, and it's costing you as well as health as healthcare because I don't get healthcare from them. So, you know, m my two children and I, we have city funded healthcare. I have asthma. Mm -hmm. I have, my children have asthma. I remember one day we went to the doctor, just the two of them, and for one child, it cost over a $1,000 because she needed um, a asthma, you know, the nebulizer machine for medication. That alone cost $500. And so the, the city is splitting the bill while this multi-billion dollar cosmetic company is, you know, they're sitting back just count, counting their cash. and they can they have more than enough money to fund this well and you know it's it, there's caring for children there's caring for maybe an ailing family member mm -hmm. whoever it is that you need to provide care for there's also going to school i think one thing is that we um they don't tolerate that they anymore. don't I, I mean that's stunning. They don't. You know, one of the one of the myths about retail is mm -hmm. that it's a great job to have while you're in school because you can yeah. work part time. It, it can be flexible. And so, are you saying that that's that the retail that was there 20, 30 years ago they could help people um, create that kind of balance just isn't there anymore? It's not there, from my experience, because I've, I've been in my present position for, like I said, about 18 months. So I was looking for work and. Some some interview was outright asked you, are you in school? You know, because they don't want to deal with students because they want you to have open availability. If my, you know, if we tell you at the last minute to be here at eight o'clock in the morning, they don't want to hear that you have to go to school. So it, I find that it, it's a lot harder. And as Carrie mentioned before with race in scheduling, it's, it's a lot easier for a, a white student to say, well, you know, I'm going to school for whatever, and I could only work Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And they're like, okay, cool, but for people of color, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't run so smoothly, you know? They, they find ways to, 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 dis, to not hire you for the position. That you just know? isn't, that's just, that's So wrong. it's not, and there aren't many students in retail today. The majority of of the workers are people with families, and who already have a lot of education. And who already in that too. <laughs> Seventy percent of the workers we surveyed had some form of of a high like school diploma, some eight. college, yeah, college here. graduates. Yeah. He, I mean, it, the solution. College yes, grad, yeah. college yes. grad. He's going to get his master's. Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, you've managed it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's. You know, you, you come to America from Africa to make a living. And, and so you come to get your share of the American dream. And then you start work and you realize that there's no way you're going to get the American dream if you are not included in the American promise of equality. And so before you move forward, you got to get, you got to be, in, you, you got to be equal to the others in terms of the promise of America before you can move to getting the American dream. And that is why I'm with the Retail Action Project, and that is why I'm fighting with the Retail Wholesale Department Union, and, and, and that is why I'm organizing retail workers to make sure that we get our share of the American dream. You know, that is, that is the perfect way, place to end our conversation here today. That was inspiring and fantastic. Thank you, Malik. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Carrie. Um, this is such an important conversation, and it was, it's just an honor to have been able to have it with you today. Thank you.